And John, whenever you're ready. Okay, good evening. Um, welcome everyone to the uh, 2021 Kings Washington Area Alumni Club's Career Day Program. My name is uh, John Wetterow and I'm the member of the King's class of 1970. I'm also a proud member of the King's Washington Area Alumni Club's Executive Committee, uh, commonly known as QUAC for short. I'm happy to be your host tonight and to welcome each of you, students, presenters, alumni, friends, and even King staff uh, to the first virtual QUAC Career Day program. QUAC Career Day is traditionally hosted here in Washington, D.C by the QUAC Executive Committee. For many years, the ex exciting program has provided a wide range of professional opportunities to King students, thanks to the generosity of many King's DC area alumni and friends, many of whom are presenting tonight and also observing in the seasons, the sessions this year. If you haven't already, please be sure to mute yourself while our presenters are speaking. There will be a time at the end for Q and A so save your questions for that time or put your questions into the chat feature. Kings is recording this session for future access. We've had five sessions this year in, career, uh, in our career day. This is the last one uh, for this year and probably gonna be the best one. So uh, this session of course is titled Management Consulting in Washington DC and Beyond. Uh, I will introduce the moderator at this time. His name is Edwin Cabbage. He's a 1980 graduate. He brings nearly 45 years of experience in the defense, civilian, intelligence, and home security sectors, ranging from operations and acquisition management. As you can see it right there in front of you on the screen. So with that, I'll turn it over. No need for me to read it. Uh, I'll turn it over to Ed and, his, and he'll introduce his team. It's all yours, Ed. Okay, John, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Kings for you know, allowing us this opportunity to promote the area that you know, we like so much. Um, you know, DC offers quite a bit. And you know, just to highlight a few things about this, this area called management consulting. You know, not a lot of people really hear about it. You know, everybody wants to be a doctor or a lawyer, you know, an accountant, a teacher, but uh, what the heck is a management consultant? And today we have three people that kind of embody the characteristics of a management consultant and have done very well uh, in their careers. I've known everyone for at least 10 years and um, you know, extremely proud to have them on the panel today to you know, share their experiences. You know, just to highlight a few things about the Washington DC area and management consultant. There's about 375,000 federal employees in, in the DC area but there's over 600,000 federal contractors that support uh, government operations. And that's typically through management consulting. And you've heard of companies like Deloitte and Ernst & Young and Accenture and Kearney. Well, those are the companies that do management consulting as well as 15,000 others. So when you look at the job market here, job market's pretty, uh, pretty fruitful. And I, I'll think, uh, I think you should really consider a position in management consulting. Uh, next slide. So just to um, highlight a, a couple things, you know, the last panel that we had at five o'clock today was hosted by uh, the Honorable Pat Malloy. It, it may have been the best panel discussion I've ever sat on. It was absolutely amazing. And uh, one of the speakers, was the Honorable Dennis Shea. Uh, Dennis's career uh, in politics, in the executive branch, the legislative branch, supporting Bob Dole, Assistant Secretary of HUD, you know, amazing positions. But he said four things about coming to DC for a position. And I think our speakers today are perfect examples of these four things. First thing he said was, be positive in your office. You know, so whatever job it is that you take, be positive and, and focus on your job. Next thing he said is be part of your team and be reliable and dependable. 
interact with your team, get to know them. Third, he said, every job is an opportunity to learn. Regardless of what you do, take a job and learn, learn from it. When you look at the guest speakers that were uh, uh, on Pat's panel, every one of them took positions that they didn't know anything about, whether it was political, judicial, ambassadorships. They took these positions because of their proven experience and past performances, not necessarily because of the jobs they were going into. So take every job as an opportunity to learn. The other thing he noted is that if you come to DC, come to DC for the right reasons. Come to DC because of what it offers and what you can potentially contribute uh, to your job and your positions. And Pat Malloy added one thing at the very end. He said, always be honest. You know, and when you look at our speakers today, they're gonna be honest and maybe brutally honest, but that's why they're here. So, uh, you know, we have Brad, Colin and uh, Brett that will be speaking today. And the way we'll, uh, we'll run this is uh, as we introduce the speakers, I'll kind of give a little bio or overview of, uh, you know, of what they offer. So with that, if we can go to the next slide. First speaker uh, I'd like to introduce is Brad Markowitz, uh, who works with uh, Carney and Company. I've actually worked with Brad quite a bit over the years. Uh, whether it's been on proposals or on projects. Um, you know, Brad has always been a maker and shaker with Kearney. Um, he has a, a degree from Cornell University uh, in hotel management, as well as an MBA from Indiana University. Brad's a principal with Kearney and Company, where he leads the decision analytics practice, working with the Department of Defense. Brad's been in consulting for about 16 years where he's had the opportunity to work with a full range of industries, including banking, pharmaceutical, and the federal government. In addition, his consulting career afforded him the opportunity to travel internationally, having spent nearly two years traveling back and forth to South and Central America and the Caribbean. In his spare time, and we won't let Ed Carney know that you have spare time, Brad. <laughs> Brad enjoys pretending to be a golfer and spending time with his family where he finds great uh, pride boring his wife for hours with stories of his wild consulting adventures. He loves watching Sesame Street far more than his two young sons, Nathan and Evan. And when they head off to bed, he enjoys cozying up to his wife with a glass of bourbon for a little shark tank. <laughs> so with that, Brad, welcome. Hey, thanks so much, Ed. You can go ahead and uh, hit to the next slide. So Ed had told me, um, essentially, kind of keep it to 10 minutes. I, I feel like there's uh, probably a 10-minute version of this discussion. And there's also a far longer one. And so I'll do my best to kind of keep within that range. But uh, if I put myself back in your guys' shoes, you know, there's a couple things that I would want to know about the industry just to make sure that I'm making a good informed decision as I decide, you know, what, what next steps look for me. And so, you know, just to, want to cover on a little bit of my roadmap you know, how I landed in management consulting and specifically in Washington, D.C. I uh, talk a little bit about, you know, from my perspective, the highs and some of the lows of management consulting. As Ed had mentioned, uh, you know, I would love this to be an opportunity for us to be brutally honest for you guys, make sure that you're making a good informed decision, you know, based on which career you want to pursue as you come out. You know, it's got to be super exciting to, uh, you know, come up on your uh, on your senior year and or exiting school, uh, looking for what the next step uh, means to you. That's, uh, I look back on that extremely fondly. Certainly an interesting environment that you guys are coming out in. And, and hopefully at the end, we can do a little Q&A on, you know, what this world looks like, especially management consulting, based on some of the impacts of COVID-19 and the environment we're now in. And then last but not least, you know, give you guys some expectations on what to expect. You know, what does success look like? You know, what are some of the characteristics that management consulting looks for? And, and how do we thrive in that environment? And so my roadmap to management consulting, you know, bringing it all the way back, I'm originally from Phoenix, Arizona, where in the wintertime, you know, typically we have uh, about 70, 80 degrees. So as you can see here, I have a coat on myself already. If it's not 70 degrees outside, I have a winter coat on. And so how I even ended up at Cornell University in upstate New York is still a, a, is still a surprise to me. But uh, I took my first job, as Ed had mentioned, uh, heading down to the D.C. area. Uh, I was one of those people who grew up thinking that I knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. 
you know, uh, ever since I can remember, I wanted to be in hotel management, uh, specifically wanted to work in Las Vegas, wanted to run a hotel or a casino out there and uh, kind of live the life of hospitality. And it was kind of amazing to me. I would attend events like this and hear people kind of talk about their careers. And I would always question, it's like, well, how did you go to school for one thing and come out, you know, in an entirely different career? And so I still scratch my own head, kind of wondering that myself as to how did I start in hotel management? How did I land here in management consulting? But uh, needless to say, I think it's, it's fantastic. It's just something I could not grasp when I was younger as to, you know, how career, people's careers I expand and explore. And so uh, after I graduated, I came down, I actually took a cost uh, modeling job working for a land acquisition company. We were purchasing uh, land all throughout the, uh, the metro DC area, uh, essentially building models to figure out how we make the most money. You know, it's, um, uh, if you have 200 acres, do we turn this into retail? Do we turn it into residential? Do we turn it into commercial? And so really that was kind of my introduction to what is now preferably called decision analytics. You know, how do you bring together a lot of different sources of data, build a business case, and then present out, you know, the courses of action that you have, the different options that you have and, and move out on it. And so uh, that was working in land acquisition with a land management company. And then uh, in all honesty, it had been probably four or five years since I had interviewed. And so I, I was looking out to see, I want to move specifically over to commercial real estate and uh, so I took, a, uh, I took an interview with a small boutique management com uh, consulting company, in all honesty, just to waste their time. It had been a while since I had uh, interviewed and wanted to knock the cobwebs off a little bit, get some experience in what uh, interviewing was like again. And I walked in kind of wanting to waste their time and walked out accepting the job. It just was fascinating to me some of the work that they were doing both on the commercial side, which is typically industry, as well as in the federal uh, and state and local governments. And so having that opportunity, you know, introduced me to consulting. When I started with that company, I think we were about 12 people. And uh, as we continued to grow, I just kind of fall, fell in love with the ability to, you know, build a strategy, help our clients make better decisions, and then kind of bring all the pieces of the puzzle together so that they can see the full spectrum of available options to them. Uh, from there, I moved to uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, which is, uh, I guess, uh, the better part of a uh, middle-sized company, about 20,000 nationwide now. Um, that was where I had the opportunity to travel internationally. It was uh, one of the greatest experiences of my life. I was literally uh, on a plane Sunday night, flying into one of 23 different countries between South America, Central America, and the Caribbean, coming back on Thursday with just enough time to uh, get my dry cleaning done and repack and head on out. I uh, did that for the better part of two years. That was a fantastic opportunity. It was really interesting to see the rest of the world. Uh, unfortunately, uh, even spending two years down there, my Spanish is still um, subpar to say the least, but I was fortunate that we traveled with a translator who uh, helped us out. We also did a lot of work at the embassies there where everyone speaks uh, English. Um, but uh, no, it was a fantastic experience for me. Uh, my fiance at the time, who's now my wife, more or less uh, said once we were engaged and once we were married, she kind of set down a tone with me that said, look, I'd like to see you once in a while. And so that's where I made the exit out of traveling uh, every week, left Booz Allen to go over to Deloitte, which uh, in the grand scheme of things is one of the larger, uh, one of the largest companies in the industry, about 60,000 uh, nationwide. Uh, started up a federal decision and analytics practice with Deloitte as a senior manager. Uh, working with a number of different people uh, in the federal government, mainly with the FDIC, NCUA, and Ginny, Fannie, Freddie, May, a lot of the banking companies, we were dealing with uh, asset disposition. Uh, you don't hear about it too much anymore, but you may remember back in the 2007-2008 arena, the federal government was stepping in and shutting down uh, banks on a very regular basis. That still occurs fairly regularly now, but uh, you just don't see it as much anymore. It's just not interesting news at this point. And so when the government steps in and takes over a bank, uh, they take over the portfolio, uh, whether it be uh, mortgage-backed securities, whether it be credit card loans, home loans, uh, car loans, the government takes those and brings them on their balance sheet. And they have to figure out something to do with them, right? They have to sell them back out to the capital markets. So we were working with, uh, with a number of different clients, helping them package up those portfolios and push them back out to the capital markets. Again, just fascinating stuff. And then last but not least, landed over at uh, Carney. Um, the way my career grew over at Deloitte, again, I was finding myself back on the road. And so I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old now, and life on the road, leaving my wife home with two little kids just wasn't exactly what I thought was important to me anymore. And so I wanted to find a way to kind of land my feet back in D.C. instead of just leaving D.C. all the time. So joined Carney and Company, uh, again, a company that I had partnered with uh, for a number of different years 
uh, on a number of different efforts, um, but just intimately familiar with them and their leadership. And they welcomed me with open arms and gave me the opportunity to kind of uh, build a new practice with them with the Department of Defense. And so now we're really working on uh, what we call future force design. Uh, that's just uh, me having the opportunity to kind of sit in the room with some of the smartest people I've ever met, really focusing on some of the interesting problems that they have with what we call near peer competition, where there's a number of different efforts in technology between machine learning, artificial intelligence that a lot of different countries are doing different things with, and understanding what the impacts are for national security, and making sure that the United States is able to, uh, to stay on top and manage some of the expectations and uh, some of the movements that are going out there with either with the other actors. So that's how I landed in management consulting. Again, I, I've loved every moment of it. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, some of the highs and lows, I, I think I covered. Um, you know, it, depending on what you're looking for, you're working with the smartest people in the room at all times. You know, there's a lot of extremely bright, extremely talented people. And to me, it's just always interesting to find the type of experts that are out there that you're working with. You know, uh, depending on what it is, you know, you find the foremost expert in any, any given arena, whether it's pharmaceutical or banking or, you know, goodness, national defense, you're working with some of the top minds out there to help solve some really interesting problems. And again, to me, you're just waking up to a new problem every day. As soon as the problem uh, is resolved or as soon as you help improve a decision that's made on a problem, you're on to the next one. And that's just a real fun, interesting environment that keeps everything new. Um, you, we really get an opportunity to kind of explore everything. Uh, I, I tell a lot of the consultants that we hire in when they're new and, and either fresh out of college or new to consulting, you know, you really want to find out what you're passionate about. You know, you want to make sure that you're making the investment in your time and making sure that, um, you know, whatever it is that you're, you're uh, pursuing, that, that that becomes something that's of interest to you. But in order to do that, you really have to expand your mind. You really have to, um, you know, have an opportunity to kind of get the, the breadth and the depth of what's out there. And so, uh, you know, a, 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 as you work through that, you become essentially an entrepreneur, right? You, you want to pick up a number of different skill sets, something that interests you today might not interest you tomorrow. And so putting on a whole bunch of different hats and trying out different markets and different clients and different skills, you know, really help you narrow down what, what's important to you and what you're passionate about. And then you'll find that as your career progresses in management consulting, you know, your ability to fine tune those skill sets and lead teams associated with those skill sets and build a business aligned to that skill set, you know, really starts to take front and center stage as you advance. Um, yeah, so I think it's really just on you to kind of build your own career. You know, it's a, to me, it's a very empowering environment that a lot of people thrive in, but it's also a little intimidating for some about, um, you know, the empowerment that you're given. You're, you're given the power and the resources of a consulting firm uh, and able to kind of, you know, knock down whatever doors that, that, that are of interest to you as well as the rest of the team that you're building and crafting. And then last but not least, just defining success in, in management consulting. You know, I would say the number one skill that I look for uh, people is just the willingness to learn as well as to be fungible. You're going to be put in a lot of different situations. You're going to be asked a lot of interesting problems. We don't want, we're not trying to set you up to fail. We're just looking for someone who's willing to kind of take, uh, you know, take the horse by the reins, uh, dive in deep you know, not only look at the, the type of information that we provide you, but, you know, have the ability to independently research on topics, you know, look at areas that we're not looking at. And so really kind of taking the opportunity to learn at every opportunity that you're provided, not just with what the team is doing, but on your own, you know, just that genuine, um, you know, curiosity to, to learn is, is a highly desirable skill set in our field. Um, one of the greatest pieces of vices that I ever got uh, was bloom where you're planted. You're going to find that, you know, there's a lot of interesting work out there, but every once in a while, there's some not so interesting work, but having the, you know, the wherewithal to dive in, to be passionate about every problem that you're presented with, and then make sure that you have an opportunity to excel in that role. You know, you're really going to be, uh, you're, you're just going to stand out, you know, someone who takes a role that may not be as desirable, you know, and, and makes a home run out of it. You know, those types of things pay off dividends in the long run, especially with your leadership as well as with your peers. So really bloom in the, with where you're planted in every opportunity that you have. Um, I was working with a consultant that we had uh, an opportunity to, um, you know, work in a strategic communications role. He would essentially be leading uh there's a, a magazine that would go out and he was responsible for bringing together a lot of the subject matter experts to put together a magazine. And so when he went to school, you know, he, he, he did business management. He said, Brad, I don't understand exactly what this has to do with, you know, me and my progression and what I want to do. 
And what he didn't realize was that the people he's working with, the people who are asked to write articles that were associated with this magazine are some of the CEOs and some of the leading industry experts that are out there. So all of a sudden he's at the, you know, on his Rolodex as CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are people who are leading subject matter experts in their specific expertise and fields. And all of a sudden, you know, these folks were calling him directly asking for him. He's working with them one-on-one. -on -one. They know who he is now. He's able to pick up a phone and call them. And these are just things that as your career grows in management consulting, the, 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 your value becomes, you know, who you know in your network. And so instantly at 22 years old, he went from having zero connections in the industry to having every connection in the industry, which made him invaluable to, to me, my company, as well as a number of different other folks. And so he really kind of took the bull by the horns there and, and excelled and thrived in that environment. And so again, just making the most of every opportunity you're, pre you're presented, you know, really uh, packages up, you know, how you can be successful in management consulting. And so promised that I would try to keep it to 10 minutes. I think I might be a little bit over at this point, but look forward to some of the Q&A as well as uh, some of the other speakers' opinions on these things too. So thanks a lot for your time, guys. Thank you, Brad, for that. You mentioned a couple things about passion and learning that seems to be a theme among all the speakers. And you also mentioned about the success of a 22-year-old. Uh, one of the things Pat Malloy brought up was a comment that President Kennedy made how can you go from second lieutenant to president in 14 years? You know, so the successes are definitely out there. And thanks for that. Uh, next slide. Okay. Next person is a, is a relative of mine, actually. A distant relative, but we're, we're connected. Uh, Brett Marigliani is a, a 2012 graduate of King's in Business Administration and Marketing. I remembered that, Brett. And Brett has about eight years of experience in procurement sourcing as a consultant with Accenture and as a direct employee focusing on supply chain and operations, financial services, and healthcare. Brett currently supports NBC Universal Media as a sourcing manager for strategic corporate spend in financial services and Comcast benefits. As part of his role, Brett manages over $250 million in spend with responsibilities involving project management, vendor and stakeholder relationship management, contract management, negotiations, and delivering on savings targets. Brett's experience includes a diverse portfolio of support for Fortune 500 companies, including Accenture, Procter & Gamble, Nestle, Cooper Tire & Rubber Company, Avis, and the USDA. In addition to his current role, Brett is a certified personal trainer with that, I'm proud to have Brett as a guest speaker. And Brett, with that, it's all yours. Hey, thanks, Ed, and thanks, everyone. I, I hope everyone could hear me okay. Thumbs up, Ed? Perfect. All right, thank you. And uh, I think it's been about 10 years since I last spoke to the Quack community, but glad to be back, and um, thanks, everyone, for having me back. Uh, so, yeah, let's get started. Uh, before I get into some things about management consulting and, and how we could transfer those skills, since I'm no longer a, a consultant, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. So I was born and raised in Wilkes-Barre, PA. I grew up on South River Street. I believe King's is on North River Street. Uh, went to Myers High School. I don't know if there's any locals uh, currently on the call, but, um, you know, shout out to the, to the homegrowns there. And, you know, Wilkes-Barre is an interesting place to grow up. You don't really hear about management consulting, right? You hear about the old stories of, of coal mining. Um, certainly, you know, Brad said he's from Arizona. I, I've never met Brad, but um, it's pretty cool to meet him tonight. And, um, yeah, so, you know, what, what's this Wilkes-Barre native got to do with management consulting? Well, I met Ed at a Quack event, actually, um, through, through uh, career planning. And his speech really triggered me. He started talking about Apache helicopters and, and, and buying stuff for the government or, or civilian contracts. And, you know, I, I said, this sounds really interesting and I've never heard of it. Um, I, I have a major in biz, biz admin. I think it might be uh, manage, our business management now at King's and, and marketing. I really didn't know what I want to be when I grew up and I really still don't. Uh, but hey, that's okay. We, we find jobs to pay the bills and, and, you know, you find things that are tolerable, but um, you got to pay the bills. But um, I digress. I moved to D.C. Um, right after college. I, I, I actually had a girlfriend that I met at King's, and she was in the Air Force at Andrews Air Force Base. But long story short, 
I ended up uh, at a small uh, consulting firm called Catapult Consultants, uh, where Ed actually worked. And, you know, I, I can't est- stress the importance enough of making connections and staying in touch with them, because that's, an, that's a connection that really paid off. Um, and now Ed said we're sort of distant, distant relatives. That, that's true as well. So a small world. But um, let me get back to it. So I, I started at Catapult Consultants, which is a small boutique firm. You know, you hear these, these big companies like Accenture, which I actually work for as well. But these other players are, 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 you know, great opportunities. Why? Because the government has, you know, quotas or, or spend that they have to give to small businesses. And these small disadvantaged businesses pick up some of the business. So um, I believe we were a minority owned company. And I got into management consulting without even really knowing that I was getting into management consulting. I started out as a junior contract analyst. Um, I analyzed contracts with this very boring lawyer in the room day in day out. Um, I felt like I was in some sort of detention, but it paid off in the long run because I, I gained knowledge, especially from a lawyer, um, that got me into acquisition support as a management consultant for um, the USDA. And under the USDA, you know, there's other, there's other, you know, there's, there's the park service, the forest service, fish and wildlife. And I was an expert. Usually you think of a consultant as a subject matter expert, but when you're out of college, you pick up these junior positions, such as a junior, uh, junior analyst or something like that. And you learn, um, you know, I, I pride myself on being the dumbest person in the room because I like surrounding myself with the people that know more than me. And I'm like a sponge. I just listen. I ask questions. Um, and I encourage everyone to do that regardless of if you go into management consulting or not. But long story short, at Catapult Consultants, I started getting in, seeing the competitors and bidding on these different contracts. And there's Accenture, Deloitte, KPMG, Ernst & Young. And I said, these companies look pretty cool. Um, so I actually moved away from the DC area. I still visit, or I try to visit at least once a year. And I worked down in um, King of Prussia, Pennsylvania for Accenture. And what did I do there? I, I was an outsource consultant, essentially. They, they come to Accenture and to me for expertise. And the area I'm going to keep referencing is basically pro- procurement and sourcing. So what, what is that? Procurement means to buy. So they came to me for expertise on buying goods and services. And I supported these huge companies like P&G, Nestle. You know, did I, did I know what I was doing? Did, did I have any idea about supporting these manufacturing plants? No. Um, but you pick up uh, skills and, and things from people around you. So, you know, you, you look at these three, these three points that I have on the slide here, stakeholder vendor management, project timeline, and the ability to ask questions. So let me dive into that. Um, at Accenture, I had these, the main client was P&G, Procter & Gamble. And I think there's one pretty close to hometown in, in Wilkes-Barre. You know, you, these skills you, you get from management consulting, um, you need to understand your, your stakeholders. So what's that mean? Who's the one making the decision? It's very important. Um, and, you know, so many times I've been asked in my career to create a RACI which means responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. Well, I'm the one that's consulted, right? No, <laughs> or, or potentially yes. There, there's, there's multiple answers, but who's the one responsible um, for the project? So someone comes to me with a million dollar project, who's responsible for that? Who's the stakeholder that's in charge of making that final decision? And, and who's accountable? It might, be someone, it might be the same person, it might, it might be someone different. Typically at Accenture, and it's a little bit weird because I work for industry too. So I work for companies outside of consulting, but I'm the one being, being consulted, but you need to consult other people that have a stake in the business as well. And who needs to be informed? Usually that's probably someone at a higher level, possibly C-suite, um, which means, you know, someone probably making a lot more money than you that just needs to be informed about the project. They're, they're not necessarily accountable. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really important and, and management consulting, you know, to know the decision maker, because you're wasting your time if you, if you don't know who that is. Um, and that's the person you need, to, you need to sign off from. Another lesson I learned from management consulting is that that's transferable, right? So, so I'm in industry now working at NBCU, um, is building trust. You need people to trust you in order for them to listen to your advice. Um, 
and the argument you're making. So basically everything's a, a negotiation, right? You, you need to pre be prepared um, to consult. You can't come in not knowing what you're talking about. And if you don't know, you got to go figure it out. Um, that's what they're paying you money for. And half the time I fake it until I make it. You got to, got to use other resources. Some you got to pay for some, sometimes you don't, but you know, sometimes I'm scratching my head at the things I tell people, but you know, most of the time I know what I'm talking about. Um, and you got to empathize consulting management. They're coming to you because they have a problem right? Or they have a challenge that they need to solve. And even though I'm not in consulting anymore, at NBC Universal, for example, my, my business partners are stakeholders. They, they have a problem and they're coming to me because they need help. They're, they're the experts and they're coming to me on the procurement side to say, hey, can you, can you tell me how to buy this? What, what's, the, what's the market intelligence telling you about this? Which basically are facts about what you should be paying, what's available in the market, um, and you, <laughs> and um, excuse me. Um, oh, my mom's calling. And how how should we buy it? What type what type of contract? Um, so you got the stakeholder or the business to worry about, and then you got the vendor. So on procurement, I have to go to the vendors to, to source these items and consulting management, especially at Accenture, when P&G is coming to me, they're asking me to provide the knowledge of who in the market is maybe best in class. Maybe we don't have the budget to do that. Um, maybe maybe um, they want the cheapest available, which most likely isn't the right decision most of the time. And, um, you know, you got to stress to everyone, regardless of they're the stakeholder or the vendor, is you're, you're here to help and you're here to solve a problem. Um, you know, you don't want to burn any bridges with either of these people because you never know if you might work for that company later in the future or deal with that vendor later on down the road. Um, and I'm just being cognizant of time. So project management. At Accenture, I had to lead these short-term and long-term projects. And I do the same thing at NBC Universal and Avis Budget Group. So what's the timeline? When do you need this buy? Um, basically, they're coming to you for expertise, right? But you need to know how and how long it comes to because they're saying, well, I needed it last week. Well, sorry, you need to level set expectations and say, you know, this is going to take maybe two weeks or this is going to take two months or this is going to take a whole year. So the skills you, you have in management consulting, you could take to industry. And by industry, I mean working directly for these companies. Um, you always want to sort of under promise and over deliver. That's a big thing with consulting. You want to make sure that you're not setting yourself up for failure. And that's a lesson I've learned multiple times because you're going to, if you, if you say, um, push a timeline too fast at the end of the day, you're the one that's going to look so stupid. Um, and I'm getting some feedback in my headphones. I'm not taking orders here at the, at the um, check out Mickey D's, but if anyone's uh, speaking, please go on mute. And then the last thing here, Ed, I know I'm hitting 10 minutes, is the ability to ask questions. So uh, they say there's no stupid questions. On the management consulting side, I think there are. Uh, you want, <laughs> you want to make sure you're, you're, you're asking the right questions. So you want to challenge the status quo. When a project comes to me as a consultant, say at Accenture and Nestle came to me and they say they want to buy 10 widgets. Well, why do you want to buy 10 widgets? Well, because we have, it's, it's need for this. Well, how many, how many widgets do you have on hand? Well, we have a thousand widgets sitting in an in inventory. Well, it sounds to me like you don't have widgets. So you know, using questions or, or asking why has helped me a lot in my career, not just in, on the consulting side, but as a, as a sourcing manager, procurement manager in industry as, as well. And that's where you bring value. I mean, you probably learn in, at King's, you know, it's, it's a challenge. You, you want to be better, smarter, and faster as a consultant because otherwise they're going to bring that work in-house and there's no need for you. Um, so, you know, I, I've, I've done it a lot. It, that sort of connects with the uh, overpromise, underdeliver uh, piece is challenging the status quo, and you know, making a difference and showing results is really what it's all about. Now, um, Brad said, you know, about the passion piece, consulting. I think it it was a passion. I think it fades in and out 
<laughs> but you know, the, the quack piece and, and being down in DC, there's a ton of opportunity. I think Ed's first slide said, you know, 65,000 starting out. I, I wish that was the case when, when I did, I think I was making about half of that and down there it's pretty expensive, but you find a way to make it work. Um, and I know everyone at Kings is, is worthy of sort of taking on that challenge. So, um, I digress, Ed, I'll, I'll stop and pause there and I'll let Colin have some time. Thank you, Brett. And uh, a few key takeaways here, which I think, you know, we really need to, you know, pass on to uh, the students. And one of them is you emphasize networking and connections. And I think that's real important. You know, when you start working in our business, it's all about networking and connections. It, you know, where do we start off? LinkedIn. Right, we all get a profile on LinkedIn. That's part of networking and connections, and it you know just explodes from there. And just as uh, Pat Malloy talked about honesty, you talked about trust, you know, and it does go a long way. And you know, despite the the six hundred thousand contractors in the D.C. area, everybody knows everybody, you know, because if you're if you're not honest or if you can't be trusted, it gets out there. So. Good words of wisdom, wisdom, Brett. We appreciate that. And um, and with that, now we're going to introduce Colin on the next slide. Colin's another individual I uh, I met at a uh, at a uh, Quack Career Day. Colin graduated graduated from Kings in 2011 with a uh, a BA in psychology, and then in 2007 an MBA from Penn State University. Colin has over seven years experience in management consulting, beginning as an analyst at Deloitte in 2013 and continuing at Accenture in 2018, where he's currently a talent and organizational manager. Always a people person, Colin has dedicated his career to improving the employee experience for his clients, both in the public sector and the private sectors, and has built his change management expertise in areas such as strategic communications, learning and development, technology implementation, and culture transformation. Colin's a 2011 graduate of King's, and he's also a proud papa for the second time, most recently. And with that, Colin lives in uh, the Lehigh Valley area now with his wife and two kids. And Colin, it's all yours. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the opportunity to do a little bit of uh, the TNO work that I do. So just teaching and technology, if people navigate to my video screen and hover over my video, in the top right, you'll see an ellipses, the three dots. And if you have the drop down screen, click pin video. And doing that should blow up my face. I apologize for that. But then you'll also be able to see what's behind me. Backwards. Thumbs up, <laughs> if that works. Perfect. So this one, this is uh, teaching kind of what Brad and uh, Brett have already talked about of being highly adaptable as a consultant. So of course, I'm always a visual person and I know not everyone can can listen to, to lecture. So I always cater to the other visual learners if I can. Um, so if this is coming out left to right, right? Because I also had to flip my slides backwards in order for them to be seen correctly. So everyone can read this, but yes. Hey, a thumbs up, Ed. Yeah, Colin, it's actually backwards. Darn it. Of course. <laughs> of course. It's all right. So part about being highly adaptable, I try and test things out, and uh, it doesn't always work. <laughs> it's all right. So it will work. We'll figure it out. OK. That one works? Yes? Yes. That one does work. <laughs> Perfect. Now I just need to spin them all back around. Anyway, so while I do that, um, as, as you saw in my bio, um, well, actually I have direct connections with both uh, Brad and Brett um, because I started my uh, consulting journey at Catapult Consultants as well, right out of Kings. And then I went uh, from Catapult Consultants to Deloitte where I did similar contracting work. Um, from that point within Deloitte, I actually, uh, there we go. What just happened? Whew. 
Uh, from that point at Deloitte, I, I networked my way, talking about networking, into um, the consulting track. So starting as an analyst uh, for the federal government was who we were, uh, who we were getting to. Uh, I did federal government work down in DC for about a year or so before I transferred to state government work where I started traveling uh, back and forth to uh, Georgia full time. So one of the stereotypes of management consulting is that you're constantly traveling to your clients. So I was on the road Monday through Thursday for two years straight, which is why Brad left the, the tried to get off the road so he could truly have his family which I completely understand. Uh, so I was on the road for a while traveling uh, and probably five or six years into Deloitte decided to transfer over to Accenture right after having our first uh, and have been there for the last two and a half years uh, doing very similar work. So unfortunately, I can't both flip all of my slides backwards and, uh, and talk at the same time. It's a skill I haven't learned yet. Maybe when I get up to Brad's level, I'll be able to do that. But, but uh, I'll talk through some of the content and hopefully uh, I can share out some slides afterwards so everyone can kind of review. But one of the major uh, benefits of working for a larger consulting firm is that you are able to bring uh, a, a, a different elements to your clients. So within Accenture, we have our major uh, fields are strategy and consulting, which I'll talk a little bit more about today. Interactive, which uh, actually design and builds run and runs experience, both either for our clients, their employees, or patients, depending upon what industry. We have technology, which you know, is technology, you know, cloud services, systems integration, and then finally operations. So uh, we can actually run business processes for our clients, whether it be finance and accounting or marketing. Uh, or for specific industries like healthcare. So overall technology and human ingenuity always go hand in hand, especially within talent and operation or talent and organization. So what that means is not only can we bring the, the breadth of our technological capabilities, we can also bring our people ingenuity. And when they combine, that's how we, we best solve our, our clients' challenges. It's, it's about the total package. So if, if we talk a little bit about Accenture, and, and I know this has been touched on in all of, of management consulting, is it really does start with our clients. You know, we do build those trust-based relationships with our clients. As Brett mentioned, you know, one of the things that they come to is, is with their problems. Um, they are vulnerable to do so, uh, and they're also spending a lot of money for, for us to solve those problems. So we need to make sure that they trust us, uh, that we're going to give them the right solution. Uh, we also have best, class, uh, best in class industry leadership across about 40 different industries. We're the largest independent technology services provider. Uh, we have key partnerships with SAP, Microsoft, uh, and Oracle. Uh, we have a broad global footprint. We serve clients in over 120 countries. And we have uh, the best people over across the world. We have about 514,000 and we have a great culture that you know, uh, encourages us to be innovative, be collaborative and be teaming. So specifically for TNO uh, consulting or talent and organizational consulting, uh, we know the, the world is changing. Technology is changing every day, right? Corporations need to adapt to attract and attain the, their best talent and remain competitive in whatever industry they're serving. We can bring our knowledge and provide our expertise, but it's important to collaborate with your client to solve their own unique challenges. So within TNO Consulting at Accenture, we have five core offerings. One is people or, or employee experience. So the goal there would be to deliver superior employee or candidate experience so they can attract and retain the best talent. Uh, then there's organizational leadership and culture. So this covers organizational design, leadership development, uh, culture transformation uh, to drive overall values and purposes at a company. And you see this a lot when there are uh, acquisitions of companies 
or if there's a major leadership change. And then we also have work and workforce. So it's understanding your employees' skills and their capabilities and how they might be able to reshift or reskill based on what your business needs are. Then we have digital core. So this actually digitizes a lot of HR data. So it allows our clients to better understand how their workforce works. And then you have business and changeability. So here's, we have uh, transformational change, uh, hoping to achieve business outcomes. So that's a little bit about TNO. I know we touched on it. Uh, one of the things that I was trying to reflect on as part of this presentation is knowing all the people that I have met through management consulting and what is the, the underlying thread that connects them. And some of those traits um, are uh, innovation. Management consultants love to determine new ways to solve a problem in a world that is ever changing. They are naturally curious. They embrace challenges as they arise for the clients. They're adaptable, apparently not adaptable enough to understand that even though it shows as a flip slide on my screen, it's not going to show as a flip slide on your screen. We face problems with tenacity. Uh, we, we want to make sure that we're providing the right solution to our client. Uh, we are entrepreneurial and ambitious. So you make your own path in consulting. A lot of the times a project is ending and you need to look for a new project and you're reaching out, you're networking within your own company to find the right project for you. What interests you? You're also constantly learning. There's so much training outside of just your client work to make sure that you're gaining and maintaining industry knowledge, and you're aware of all the different methodologies that exist. Uh, we, we grow trusted and advise, uh, uh, advisement relationships with our clients. There is honestly nothing more that I enjoy more than a client messaging me or emailing me or just straight calling me and saying, hey, Con, I need I have a quick second. I just need to get your thoughts on something, or can we just work through and collaborate on something? And in addition to our client work, as I said, we have a lot of internal work. So during the day, I'm helping my client. And then sometimes later at night, I'm doing extra work for the firm. And that's to you know, build out research, building out additional content, and lead, so we can continue to lead innovation in our industries. And that speaks to how connected we are as a firm. So obviously, I, ideally, I can then take that leadership or the, and that research that I built within the firm to my client and other consultants can take them to their clients as well. So as an analyst, which is where you would start if you were interested in management consulting, uh, some things that you might do on a project is creating, delivering solutions to your clients, you know, building new innovative business models. Uh, you would brainstorm and collaborate with your clients. You might be able to you know, create a uh, MVP or a minimal viable product of a, a brand new technology that doesn't exist in the industry, but test it with your client. And you get to utilize your unique set of skills. So whether you are you know, a whiz at Excel and you can create a dashboard of HR data, or you, know, you are a PowerPoint guru who can you know, make an infographic that tells the data story. You get to leverage those skills and then learn from the skills of other folks on your team or other folks within, within your firm. So one of the things that I, uh, I thought would be interesting is trying to shift your, your thinking. So instead of as a student thinking of completing a semester, as a consultant, you would be completing a project milestone, which means you, know, you may have a deliverable or a piece of work that you had been working on and submitting that to your client and having it finalized would be the completion of a phase of your work. Instead of getting a grade, you would be contributing to your client's success. So ultimately you wanna get an A, ultimately you want your client to be successful. Instead of taking exams, you might be solving a complex problem, right? Think about studying for a final and bashing your head against you know, the desk thinking, 
how am I going to figure this out? How am I going to do this? It still happens once you get to the consulting world of, I need to figure out how this formula works in Excel so I can get the right data. So it's, it's just a, a complete shift of, uh, of a mindset. Instead of getting an individual grade, you're contributing to your own team and your firm's success. So I just wanna wrap up really quick with what I found to be core skills of a successful consultant. One is client relationship development. Can you build those trusted relationships with your client? whether it be you know, personally or whether it be through your work and build those relationships within your firm. Because as, as both Brad and Brett mentioned, it's all about networking. Uh, problem solving. Can you identify and address your client business issues by uh, applying results-driven techniques? Storytelling is extremely important, whether uh, it allows your clients to understand the context and the opportunities in a clear, compelling manner. And one thing that consultants are absolutely known for is buzzwords and trying to eliminate that from their uh, vocabulary is sometimes a little bit more difficult than others. But let me tell you, they are very confusing and mean absolutely nothing. Uh, value creation, uh, you wanna focus on uh, unlocking trapped value within the client, which means is there an opportunity for additional work? Anyone can find additional work at a client and there are always opportunities or conversations that bring that about. I touched on another one at the beginning, agility, remaining agile. Problems come up, there might be a way that you solved something in the past and it doesn't work for that particular client or you may have wanted to show your slides on a Zoom meeting and all of a sudden you can't do that. Can you adapt to be able to do that in a moment's time? Agility and adaptability are key. Um, and design thinking, it's a different way to uh, work with your client to understand their issue. And then finally, data and analytics. So actually being able to understand how data is going to feed your story and support your story with your clients. So I've been in management consulting for about seven years now. Uh, and for a while I have thought about leaving, but one of the reasons why I stayed was the excitement of moving from one project to another and getting the opportunity to solve these unique problems for my clients. Sometimes I am doing very similar work for each of the clients, but each client has their own particular scenario. And I get to talk to people and figure out what is going to ultimately make them successful, give them the success, get a high five, and then move on to a completely new problem, which you don't always get in industry. So I think I may be stuck here for quite a while. Thanks. Okay, excellent, Colin. Thank you. You know, more more great words of wisdom from Colin, where he's talking about technology and people to help solve problems through collaboration, innovation, and agility. So, uh, for all the speakers, Brad, Colin, Brad, thank you so much. And with that, you know, we'll open it up for questions from uh, from the uh, students. And if we don't get any, we're going to call upon you to answer. <laughs> Beth, do you have any uh, in the chat room to start us with? I have a few that were submitted before the, um, the presentation. And so I think I'm trying to choose ones that I don't think you covered. So um, one of the questions that was submitted by students uh, was, what should I be doing today to get better and increase my chances in this field of work. I'll, I'll start out. Um, one of the things that you'll ultimately want to consider, and I guess it depends on on what uh, what level you want to go at, is becoming um, hitting some of those traits that we ultimately talked about. Right, you're trying to learn, trying to discover what you're most interested in, whether it be an industry, 
whether it be uh, just an element of, you know, if it's data, if it's um, visual arts. I know there's a lot of graphic designers that I work with that, you know, bring their unique brand to consulting. So it's starting, it's starting that development of just understanding what your strengths are and how you might be able to leverage that. And then it's, it, it really does speak to what Brett said about asking questions and networking of being comfortable, being uncomfortable, and getting to the right point of asking questions. Um, well, I mean, Brett, you know, nailed it right on the head of, you know, how many times do you, do you feel you need to come to the table with an answer or a solution? And you need to listen first and ask the questions to be able to, to actually be able to, to solve the problem. Brad, you know, with, uh, with all your experience, uh, you know, with Booz Allen and Carney and others, you know, you made a, some good uh, comments and uh, what were some of those decisions that, that kind of drove you to go to Booz Allen and then go to Carney and some of the other companies? What were you looking for or what, what drove your decisions? <laughs> Sure. I, I think maybe the best way to answer that is just, to me, I, I always feel empowered in an entrepreneurial environment. And so when I joined the boutique firm, um, you know, those, those guys were like 12 guys. It was, you know, direct access to the owner. Uh, we had a softball team. Uh, and, and so there, to me, it was, this was ground zero, right? They're a company that doesn't exist right now. They're looking to grow. You know, fortunately, in the time I was there, we were able to grow from 12 people to just south of 100. And so, you know, growing a company almost fivefold or, you know, sixfold, there's something entrepreneurial about that. You know, you're doing a lot of interviewing, a lot of hiring, a lot of client relationship management, you know, building our portfolio in a number of different directions. And so uh, to me, the, the move there was, it was a very flat organization. And so at that point, I was pretty young in my career. And I needed like some middle management experience, right? You know, I was on that threshold of, well, hey, I'm no longer a junior guy. I need to figure out what middle management looks like. And so, you know, I had to sit down with the owner who actually I still play on his softball team today, you know, sat down with him and said, look, this is what I'm looking for. Can I get this here? And he, you know, walked me through his thoughts on it and how I can get some of the exposure to it. But I think ultimately he agreed. He said, look, we're a boutique firm. We're not, you know, we're not layer upon layer. You know, you're either the owner of this company or you're not the owner of this company. And that's the way we built our culture. And that was a fantastic culture that I really loved and thrived in for a while. But he said, look, if I can't find a way to keep you, let me introduce you to some of my friends over at Booz Allen, because those guys are guys that have books, you know, textbooks about textbooks. And so I moved over to, to Booz Allen, you know, again, with an entrepreneurial mindset, I went on to a team that the, uh, again, it's kind of hard to translate the uh, the layers of management in some of these consulting firms. But the, my direct uh, boss was a team of one at that time. And he said, look, Brad, I'm really trying to build out this decision analytics practice. I want to do some cost modeling. You have that background. It's just you and me, man. Let's figure this out together. And so again, it was him and I sitting in his office. You know, How do we build a team? What is it that we need to do? How do we go to market? What's our client base? Who's buying what we're selling? And so together, he and I built a team of about 40 folks together, and we had a, a tremendous success. You know, a lot of that was down in Central America and South America. And again, some of my discussion was less about me and more about, you know, kind of my goals in life. You know, at that point, you know, I proposed my girlfriend and, you know, I think she would have liked to have seen a lot more of me and I need to slow down and kind of hang up my travel boots for a while. But, uh, you know, alongside with that, you know, I could have stayed with Booz Allen, but, uh, you know, when I spoke to Deloitte, Deloitte wanted to build a decision analytics practice focused on the federal government. And so, again, you know, it was Brad, come in here. We're going to give you the power and resources of Deloitte, and we want you to carve out white space for us. We want you to figure out how Deloitte goes to market in the federal market on decision analytics, building business cases for the federal government and cost modeling. 
And so again, to me, that was just uh, yet another opportunity to be entrepreneurial, right? You know, this was uh, Brad, a team of one kind of figuring it out and seeing how I want to be successful in that arena, you know, meeting with some of the, the power and resource of Deloitte. I mean, again, these are the smartest guys in the room. It has been at least a decade, if not more, since I walked into a room and I was the smartest person in it. I mean, there's just a lot of talent out there in management consulting and it, and it really shows. And a lot of people are open to kind of helping you. And so the, the great thing about Deloitte is, you know, they bring you in they take a chance, right? They say, well, okay, well, let's see if Brad can do it. But at the same time, they want to give you the momentum and the tools you need to succeed. And so sitting down with some of these smart guys and saying, okay, what are we trying to do here? What is the brand we're trying to craft? You know, who do we need to be successful? They gave me a lot of empowering and de decisions where I was, you know, hiring people in what we call strategic hires, which means I don't have a contract yet, but I need to build a team around a capability. And so we were hiring a lot of folks, uh, you know, growing a footprint, growing a team, and then we were off and running. You know, again, just unfortunately, you know, when I was in your guys' shoes, uh, again, I'm sure you guys have, you know, thoughts about what's most important to you. When I was coming out of college, what was most important to me was kind of taking over the world and making the most money I can at the time. And so as you grow up, you know, again, sometimes that might be ultimately what, what you decide is most important to you. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, you know, I had a very interesting change of heart when I welcomed my first son into the world. You know, that was a life-changing experience for me that really kind of helped bring things into perspective. And sure, money is obviously important and it always will be. But at the same time, you know, I wanted to focus on being there with my wife, being there with my kids and the way that my portfolio grew at Deloitte. I was up in New York once or twice a week. I was down in Charlotte once or twice a week. I was out in Austin, Texas once or twice a week. And so depending on where the action was, I was moving. And so when you're working in, you know, banking and pharmaceuticals, that's where these companies are and that's where you have to go. And so ultimately, you know, again, I did some real soul searching on it, but uh, I had teamed with uh, this company, Carney and Company that I'm, that I'm with now and have been for a while. I've known these guys for, you know, forever and a day. These are, you know, I wasn't just making an uncalculated decision to move. These were people that, uh, that I knew, that I trusted, that I'd grown to love. And, you know, we really enjoyed their culture as well. And it was an opportunity for me to, once again, hang up my traveling boots and then just stay here and focus in the DC area. You know, when you're focused in the federal government, what better place to be in DC? When you're focused on the Department of Defense, like I am, what better place to be than next to the Pentagon? And so that is now, you know, kind of where I, I where I align my focus. So instead of, you know, hopping on a plane and being in Austin, Texas, three hours later, I hop on a, well, not so much anymore because of what's going on out there, but uh, the Pentagon's 15 minute drive from my house now. And so again, some of those moves were really focused on what was important for me, but at the same time, some of the, you know, the carrots that were dangled in front of me were always around an opportunity to start over as a, a, a team of one. And how do I build a practice and how do I build a business around that? That to me is just, you know, kind of my passion, what I really like to do. So sorry for the long-winded answer, but I uh, hope that gave you guys some perspective. Thanks, uh, Brad. That was interesting. And, um, Brett, just uh, one last question for you and see if you can answer it fairly quickly is um, you're a college student, you're a senior, you're logged into this, uh, um, uh, into, this, into this meeting. What advice would you give these folks when they're out looking for a job? Did you say me, Ed? Yes, I did. Or All Jacqueline? Because right. my name says Jacqueline. <laughs> At least, yeah, my, my wife's upstairs actually putting our, our son to sleep. But uh, the advice, I spent countless hours up at the Barnes & Noble on LinkedIn um, sharpening my profile. I had internships under my belt, which the Office of Career Planning really stressed me. I thought it was a joke at first, but come sophomore year, uh, my parents also kept pushing it because they saw my brother and sister and the success they had. So experience, regardless of if it's in management consulting, I, I don't even know if you could get that around in, in Wilkes-Barre or, or the area there, but, you know, building your resume, regardless of the work, I, I worked at Barton Irby's as a, as a bus boy. Um, I worked at Frontier Communications up in Dallas. I worked at Leadership Wilkes-Barre on the square. I worked at Geisinger on the square. What did all these jobs have in common? Really nothing, but I put it on my resume and it said, okay, this, this guy has initiative. Um, does he know in, in my first job, I dealt with contracts and, you know, a business process outsourcing ad for sourcing. It's like, does, does this guy have any idea what uh, about this? No, but my work experience shows that. 
Um, so build your resume, put your jobs on there, use your, the resources around you and the connections. Um, any of the professors at King's that, that may know someone or even the, 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 the quack resources as well. You know, Ed's been so successful. Um, he might have a resource. Ask him questions. You know, we, we can't just make jobs magically appear, but asking questions, as I said before, is, is really the key. And things will line up, you know, everyone's coming out of college with, with student loan debt. I, I had that on my back. It took me a very long time to pay it off. Um, so, you know, you can't just look at, look at the money, like, like Brad said, yeah, it's, it's important, but you really want to try to find that passion. Um, and, you know, Ed said I was a personal trainer. I think fitness is ultimately my passion, but, you know, consulting and, and working in industry, basically doing the same thing I was doing as a consultant isn't so bad. So uh, I'll stop there, Ed. So hopefully that that gives um, Isaac, for some reason, you keep coming on my screen. I don't know why, but glad you're here. You're here through the whole presentation. Hope you hopefully you take something away. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. And it seems like, you know, among all the speakers, you know, we have to stay flexible. We have to stay adaptable, you know, take advantage of what's in front of you build those relationships that trust. And you know what, you're going to be successful uh, in our business. So uh, Colin, Brad, Brett, thank you guys so much. I know you guys are busy. You're, you're, you're all dads, recent dads, you're COVID dads. Uh, thank you uh, so much for your time and, and uh, patience tonight. So with that, Beth, uh, thank you as well. And we'll turn it back over to you. Hey, are there any other questions, Beth? I think so many of the questions that we had were were answered. Um, um, if there's a student on that that has a question that we did that wasn't covered, um, now's the time to unmute yourself and come on um, because all the questions, most of the questions that were pre-submitted, I shared with these panelists um, beforehand. So they, I think they answered a lot of them. I just want. Oh, I'm sorry, John. I just want to say, Colin, Colin saying, bring on the questions. That's a consultant. <laughs> and, um, and he also said it in the chat. Let me just say, you can have a work-life balance if you're a consultant. Everyone talks about travel um, and, and going, you know, being a road warrior, which, you know, typically travels Monday through Thursday. But it's possible, especially now with COVID, to do all this remotely and within the bounds of what you might deem as normal, which is nine to five, which um, technically that's not really uh, an option as a consultant, you always have to be there ready for the client. Are, are there any students that have any uh, questions? Uh, last, last call. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask a question, but also, uh, Brett, I am a, I'm a Mohawk as well, local to Wilkes-Barre, so that was cool. Um, I guess a question that I would ask is, I saw a lot of similarities with your stories. A lot of you guys started off small and you got big, and that's more often than not, uh, what happens? What would you say to some of us students that want to get into a big company like Carney or, um, you know, Accenture or something like that? Uh, uh, one thing that's true. Oh, go ahead, yeah. Brian. No, Colin, you take it. I'll just shout it. Thanks, okay. Isaac. Mohawks forever, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say one thing that you'll have to think about a lot of the times, uh, and this is just kind of insight into recruiting, a lot of the major firms have target schools. So they'll, they'll reach out to particular schools that they've gotten candidates from in the past and only have interviews with them, um, which is unfortunate. I don't agree, really agree with the practice, but I also don't run recruiting. Uh, it, it makes sense uh, to, a, to a point, but uh, you know, Deloitte and Accenture likely aren't going to send recruiters to you know, Kings in Wilkes-Barre. Um, but obviously, you know, to that point, uh, there are King's graduates that work for Deloitte, Accenture, uh, PwC, and other consultants. So how do they do it? Um, one way is networking, right? Knowing who, who's there, contacting those individuals, connecting with them, telling them you're passionate. Uh, and another thing is what Brett touched on, is you know, taking work where it is, building your experience um, in a particular industry, or even not. Um, you know, and I think Brett touched on it, I touched on it, that, you know, we started our careers and it wasn't in anything, well, mine at least wasn't in anything that was related to the work that I'm currently doing, 
but it allowed me the leverage and the connection points to be able to get into consulting. Some of it was, you know, networking, some of it was luck, but, you know, I, I immediately went from, you know, my first job out of college to Deloitte, not for consulting, but I, I was able to get there. So it's, it's knowing that any opportunity can, can give you that path. And I'll close with, with one other thing. One thing that you'll have to do regardless of um, firm is most consulting firms are known for within their recruiting uh, of doing case interviews. And case interviews aren't something that is typical at other, uh, other in, within other industries. And it's essentially giving you a, a scenario that was a client scenario and having you work through that, that scenario out loud in an interview, either with others or by yourself. Uh, so if you're really passionate about it, is trying to, to get that skill down because it is a skill to be able to do that. Um, so learning a little bit more about case interviews. Isaac, I think the only thing I would add to that, and I think Colin hit on it, is really breaching out to that network right? You know, take a look at LinkedIn. And it doesn't necessarily, you know, obviously, uh, you know, people who are, are from your alma mater, you know, I, I think are most likely to respond. But also keep in mind, uh, what I would like to believe you took away from from this uh, meeting is that we love talking about the work that we're doing. And so it's not just us, right? If you looked at Deloitte, or if you looked at Accenture, and found an industry, it's like, you know what, I'd be curious to know what decision analytics looks like at Deloitte. Let me find one of the partners or senior managers over there and ask them some questions. If you fired out an answer, you know, a very non-threatening question along the lines of, you know, hey, saw your profile, saw you with Deloitte, just genuinely interested in like what you do, people will tell you their story, man. And so you might get a little bit more than you bargained for, but people are always welcome to tell you about like how they got to where they are and what's interesting to them and what they think you should be interested in. So just bring, you know, sort of that genuine curiosity, just obviously temper it with, you might get a, a, an earful, but at the same time, like that's step one for you building a relationship and opening up a door. You know, he might not be able to find the spot within his team, but he's going to know the 10 other partners in Deloitte that may have spots in their team as well. So be persistent about it. Don't feel like you're in a perfect position, right? It's a it's very non-threatening to reach out and say, hey, guys, you know, just curious about what you do on a daily basis. Some people will answer, some people won't. But at the same time, you know, it's a, it's a great targeted way to start pushing the agenda in the direction that you want it to go. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. With that, I want to thank the, um, the team. Uh, Ed is a team leader and uh, Brad and Britt and uh, Colin. And uh, I want to thank everybody on behalf of the uh, Quack Executive Committee for uh, this uh the last of our five, um, last of our five programs that we had this year. So, looking forward to uh, uh, responses from the people. Some, uh, hopefully, we'll get some feedback from the students as far as how everything went, and we'll look forward to uh, having another one for next year. So, with that, thanks everybody, and 